SEP Fanfic Readings presents What the Room Requires by Olivia Reckham. Chapter 17 Draco I sat up. My right hand flew to the inside of my left arm. I hissed through my teeth. My skin burned as if on fire iron pressed against it. I opened my eyes and blinked rapidly. My stomach turned over. I sat in silence and fog. My hand clenched around my forearm. A man stood in front of me. Light shone from his white maned head. Darkness tumbled in a cloak down his shoulders. His perfect, distinguished, angular countenance bent toward me. His mouth hardened to a line. His ice gray eyes pinned me where I sat. Slowly, his right eyebrow raised in the same expression he had always given me when he had found that I had been sneaking off to diddle with my toys rather than studying. Then, My father stretched out his pale, strong right hand to me and beckoned with his fingers. And in that instant, everything fell away beneath me. The warmth and the light of the barley field, the safety and the quiet of the willow, the laughter and starlight in Hermione's eyes, the feel of a wedding ring on my hand as I danced. Reality hit me in the face, just as the cold water from the sink had done when I had fled to the boys' bathroom after seeing Katie Bell. It woke me up up and out of the dream I had wanted to believe in. What had happened in the room of requirement faded to the back of my mind. My life, my real life, rose up before me. Darkness swallowed me, and I knew my name again. Hermione. I felt cold and clammy and stiff. I opened my eyes. I stood in the middle of a gray, dusky field. Fog surrounded me. I heard my breath as I sucked in. The grass beneath my feet crunched as I shifted my weight. My gaze darted around me. How had I gotten here? The last thing I remembered, I was sitting on the ground with Draco looking at the stars. It was dark, but it was the dark of thick fog rather than night. My heart began to pound. I was alone. Draco? I called. My voice echoed hollowly. I wrapped my arms around myself, then gasped, glancing down. I wore my school uniform again. My head whipped up. I was completely disoriented. Draco, where are you? I gasped, taking fistfuls of my sweater. Draco? I caught sight of a shadow, just at the edge of my vision. I froze. It was walking toward me. My throat locked. The shadow had shoulders and a pale head. It walked with a familiar stride, and my fear broke. Draco, I said breathlessly. Where did you go? What happened to the room? He came into my view, and my fear returned full force. Then it tripled. He wore all black a flawless suit with a high-necked shirt. He walked as Draco walked, and his hands in his pockets as Draco would, and bore Draco's sharp, handsome features, but his countenance was as hard as marble, and his eyes were black as the abyss. Hello, Granger, he greeted me, his tone like a knife's edge. Fancy meeting you here. He stopped a few paces away and canted his head. Getting lonesome for me? What are you doing here? I gritted, trying to keep my muscles from turning to liquid. I wouldn't miss this entertainment, he sneered. I must confess, though, that I might feel sorry for you, if I weren't too busy laughing. Get out of here, I snarled, clamping my arms tighter around myself. Ah, he barked out, amused. Why the sudden change of heart? You were thinking about snogging me just a moment ago. How dare you, I spat. He arched an eyebrow, gave me a poisonous smile, and stepped towards me. You were laying your head against me. You, that was not you. I insisted, taking several steps back. That was Draco Malfoy. He spread out his hands. I'm Draco Malfoy. No, you're not, I shot back, forcing myself to glare into those black, fathomless eyes. You are nothing like him. I see. He stopped and nodded, his face losing its ghostly smile. So, your Draco Malfoy wouldn't have one of these, then, would he? Casually, he reached down took hold of his left sleeve and pulled it up, and unveiled a black, slowly writhing, dark mark tattooed on his white skin. My heart stopped. Beautiful, isn't it? He purred, watching my face. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. No. No, I ground out. Remember who you're with, Granger, he said, stirring the echo of a memory. He gave me a narrow look, then stepped toward and tapped his finger against my forehead. It felt like ice. A great shudder ran through me, but I was paralyzed. He leaned into me, pressing the side of his cold face to my cheek. 
Slytherins do whatever it takes to accomplish our ends, he hissed. And purebloods never change, least of all Malfoys. He lifted his head. He looked down his nose at me. I felt my whole soul crumbling. He smirked. He took three steps back, holding both arms out to his sides. But feel free to try and prove me wrong, he crowed, then pointed at me. I can't wait to see your face. And all at once the fog swallowed him, and he disappeared. I thrashed. My eyes flew open. I stared upward at the distant, cleary, starry sky. I was lying on a blanket wrapped in another blanket. The edges of my vision were bordered by silver stalks of barley. I sat up, my stomach twisting and nodding, my heart heaving. I strained my neck, looking all around me, over the tops of the barley. All that greeted me was a dark, vacant horizon, and the sad, drooping branches of the willow behind. Draco was nowhere to be seen. I leapt to my feet, absently noting that I wore my school clothes again, and staggered away from the blankets. Draco! I shouted, my voice shattered, adrenaline and unreason pumping through my veins. I felt that I might collapse at any moment. I fell toward the willow, knocked the curtain aside and looked in, but the room was empty. Draco! I whirled around, searching with all my might, my skin shivering. Draco, where are you? Something moved, a figure far away. It was him. I broke into an unstable run, gasping, pain shooting through my chest. He turned toward the sound of my crashing steps. He looked pale, wild, a hunted look in his eyes. His blue eyes. I knew him. But unsensible fury, disbelief, terror, and nausea had robbed me of my mind. Where did you go? I demanded as I rushed up to him amidst the silver stalks of barley and beneath the white stars. My voice was barely under control. I don't know he stammered, backing away from me. I had a nightmare. You're awake now, and so am I, I snapped, my fist clenching. But the nightmare I had is following me. I can't get rid of it. I can't. I have to see something. Draco froze. He stared at me. His eyes looked silver in this light. Silver and stark. What? Show me your arm, I commanded, scalding tears suddenly spilling down my cheeks. Show it to me. Now. Now. I want to see it. Panic crossed his face. Hermione, he retreated. I want to see it, I screamed, lounging after him and grabbing his left wrist. Show me. Show me. I know it's not there. I know it isn't. Get off, he roared, shoving me. Let go. No, I won't, I howled, clawing at the button on his cuff. It can't be there. I know it isn't. But I have to. Draco, let me see it. I have to. Fine he thundered, knocking me away and prying the button loose himself. He grabbed his sleeve and yanked it up to his elbow. My entire world stopped moving. It didn't writhe, and his skin looked even whiter in contrast. But a black skull stood out upon the inside of his arm, and from that skull's mouth spilled a snake, like a thick, curling, grotesque tongue. A dark mark. That moment stretched on for eternity. Neither of us spoke. His right hand trembled where he held up his sleeve. I felt his eyes fall on me, fix on me. I sensed him shaking, but I couldn't look away from that abomination. That ebony venom coiled underneath the first layer of his skin. That incarnation of the touch of evil hand. The outer key to the hell within. The mark of a murderer. A demon. A death eater. It, it isn't what it looks like, Draco insisted, his voice shaking. Oh, really? I said listlessly. What does it look like? I know. I, I know what it is, he snapped. But you, there is no possible way for you to understand. What is there to understand? I cried, my whole chest wrenching as I finally lifted my eyes to his. You've decided to become a Death Eater. You've, you've become a follower of... But I couldn't finish my sentence. I couldn't speak of Voldemort in the same breath as Draco. The words burned my tongue. A lot you know, he retorted, his brow twisting. I didn't decide to become a Death Eater. I was chosen. I swallowed as if a nail was stuck in my throat. Another pair of tears tumbled down my face. Why? I gasped. Draco helplessly searched the heavens. Because of my father, he replied thickly. Because, because my father disappointed the Dark Lord, and I, out of everyone else, I was chosen to redeem my family's honor. I watched him. He was so pale, and dark circles stood around his eyes, which gazed at me still. His lower lip trembled. How? I whispered. He went quiet. 
His gaze flickered. Then he let out a shuddering breath. I'm to kill Dumbledore. My lips parted, but I made no sound. Somewhere underneath my left shoulder blade, I felt a sharp, penetrating shaft of agony enter my body. Draco took another rattling breath. I'm to kill him, and then let the rest of the Death Eaters through the vanishing cabinet in the... He swallowed hard, and I had to watch his lips catch his next words. In the room of requirements. I don't understand, I stammered, feeling like I stood in a haze. There's another vanishing cabinet in the shop in Diagon Alley, Draco murmured. They create a passage, if fixed properly. It, the one here was hidden in the room of requirement. You know, the room that appears when you need a place to hide something. Some semblance of a little smile pulled at the corner of his mouth. I felt broken in a million pieces. You can't, I choked, barely making a sound. You can't want to do this. You can't want to murder. I don't have a choice, Draco erupted, his eyes blazing with unfamiliar fire. You always have a choice, I screamed. His eyebrows came together, and he looked at me with piercing earnestness. Who told you that, Hermione? I gulped and shivered. I wrapped my arms around my wounded chest. I wasn't told, I whispered. It's something I believe. He shook his head, his expression turning cold. That is just ignorant, he said. There are other worlds besides your own, Granger. Completely different lives, different situations, different expectations. I know. No, you don't, he cut me off. You know nothing. My entire life I was bred to do one thing, to succeed my father as master of the Malfoy family and the leader of the disciples of the Dark Lord. Never was there a question. Never was there a choice. He shook his head, giving me a bitter, disdainful look. I was a piece of metal being forged with every breath I took. Every instant you knew me, every word I said to you and Potter and Weasley and every other muggle-born or muggle-lover has been hammered into me. I knew nothing else, nor did I care. I didn't learn to make friends, to love people, or be kind, or gentle, or good, because that was not my purpose. The sharp look faded. His jaw tightened. It isn't my purpose. I was born for one reason. I'm alive for one reason. Just an instrument. He looked at me, then glanced all around at the field. It was complete stupidity to think otherwise. My body quivered. Draco, don't you dare! You're looking at me like that again, he snarled, pointing at my face, like you feel sorry for me. But you don't. You don't. Look at this. He held out his arm again, sweeping his sleeve up so the mark dominated my vision. This is what I am. Remember what you felt when you first saw it. I watched you. I am all of those things. I can't escape it. And to try would mean the end. No, Draco, you can, I started. He will kill me, Granger, he said, his voice like stone and my mother, and father, if I don't do as he asks. So there it was, the answer I had been searching for, the words I had been waiting to hear ever since I crossed the threshold of this room of requirement. And now that I heard them, they almost split me in two. Draco had cursed the necklace he gave to Katie Bell in hopes of Dumbledore touching it and being stricken dead. This was the shame Mr. and Mrs. Malfoy had spoken of in Draco's torturous vision. This was the task his father had urged him to complete. A cold wind blew across us. It whirled around us and cut through our robes. I could think of nothing to say. I caught sight of something at the edge of my vision. I turned my head to look. There, in the distance, standing like a gray stone wall, in a great wide circle around our willow, stood an army of leafless, gray, gnarled trees. Black shadows lurked between them. A single hole stood amidst them, like the door to a tunnel, and a dim, gray light shone there. The forest was back. I looked again at Draco. He gazed where I had been looking, and his face filled with pain. Neither of us spoke. The wind whipped against us again. His expression went hard, his gaze shielded. This was all a dream, Granger, he muttered. The kite and the chessboard and the dance. All nonsense. He met my eyes, and suddenly there was Malfoy again. The aloof, cruel, shuddered young man who carried a chill with him. The look of ice the aspect of snow. You are a student at Hogwarts, a Gryffindor, a Muggleborn, and a friend of Harry Potter, he bit out. And I am a pureblood and a Death Eater, and I'm going to be killed trying to assassinate the Headmaster. That is all. The end. After a moment, he forced a smirk and shook his head. Get that sad look off your face, Granger. You've wanted to get that information out of me for nearly a month. 
It's the only reason you followed me in here, isn't it? It isn't as though you care for me. His jaw tightened. I know you don't. I couldn't speak. Pain riddled my throat and my breastbone. I stepped toward him through the barley. He blinked and recoiled, but then I took hold of his left arm this time. I was very gentle. Though my fingers shivered, I reached up to his elbow and unrolled his sleeve and pulled it down so it covered the mark. I felt him bow his head over me and watch what I did. Shakily, I buttoned his cuff. Then I stretched my hands up and straightened his crooked collar, smoothed the shoulders of his shirt. Then I slid my arms around his neck and buried my face against the soft, warm skin of the side of his throat. For a moment, he just stood there, stiff. Then he let out a long breath, like the last breath of a dying man, and weakly nuzzled his face down onto my shoulder. But he did not hold me. It felt like he was breaking beneath my hands. I cried. I couldn't stop myself. Tears ran down my nose and soaked his collar. But I just pulled him closer, and I slowly stroked the back of his head. What? What did you have a nightmare about? I whispered through trembling lips. He did not answer me. I squeezed my eyes shut, choked back a sob, and took a fistful of his hair, and held him all the tighter. But the closer I held him, the more I felt him slipping through my fingers like sand. Hermione We lay side by side in the willow room. Draco wrapped up in his blanket. I lay on top of mine and stared straight upwards. The blue lights in the boughs of the tree did not seem so bright tonight. Outside, the wind shifted restlessly, and once in a while it moaned far away, like a ghost out on the moor. Draco rested on his side, his back to me. He had turned away after we had held a brief but decisive discussion that outlined six points. One, there was a timetable to the task Draco was to perform. We had no idea how long we had been trapped here, but if Draco failed to appear in certain places at certain times, all hell would break loose, as opposed to the hell he was supposed to unleash. Two, the forest had reappeared. The path had reappeared as well, but with an unfamiliar beckoning light. Three, the room had obviously reached a decision about the reason we were there. Our field, our willow, suddenly felt inhospitable, ominous, harsh. Its wind sliced, its ground felt hard. The walls of the willow room had become thin, and the lights had dimmed. The room wanted us out. Four, the poisonous fog had chased us back into the willow, stalling all action until morning. Five, despite my best efforts to convince him otherwise, Draco was resigned to his fate and he was suddenly through with hiding from it. Whatever he had dreamed, it had sealed his decision, and he was not willing to talk about it. Six, it was clear we were out of time. With the suddenness of the train wreck, our dream world had smashed and reality had slammed us into us. Our true lives pulled at us, whether we wanted them to or not. Come the flames of Hades or Armageddon, we were crossing the threshold at dawn. At least, that's what I let Draco believe. I lay my head over and gazed at the back of his. I swallowed hard. I had no intention of taking him out of this room and into that torment. I would get up, tonight, and find the door alone. I would leave him here, safe, hidden from the claws of his father and Bellatrix and Voldemort. And I would run with all my strength to Dumbledore. Dumbledore would know the answer to this terrible riddle. He would be able to protect Draco. He would be able to put a stop to all of this. I was going to fight. I was going to fight for Draco Malfoy because he had no one else who would. But Draco could not discover that I had gone, and I knew he was not asleep yet. I sat up, propping myself on my side with my elbow, facing him. Slowly, trembling, I took a breath. Oh, hush thee, my dear one, thy sire was a knight, thy mother was a lady, both lovely and bright, I sang, very softly, and just as I had hoped, the little golden lights, though weaker than before, drifted up from the grass and hesitantly crept over him. I swallowed hard and kept singing. The woods and the glens from the towers which we see, they all are belonging, my dear one, to thee. O oh, hush thee, my dear one, thy sire was a knight. O oh, hush thee, my dear one, so bonny, so bright. Tears dripped down my face, clouding my vision as my voice wobbled and tensed, my brow twisted, and each word that came from my lips turning into a fervent promise. O oh, fear not the bugle. Though loudly it blows, it calls but the warders that guard thy repose. Their bows will be bended, their blades would be red, ere the step of a foeman draws near to thy bed. The light sank in down inside him. 
He was asleep now, I was certain. Gulping, more hot tears running down my cheeks, I scooted closer to him, dared to stretch out my hand and softly caress the hair just above his ear, watching his still, white face as he slumbered. Oh, hush thee, my dear one, I whispered. Thy sire was a knight, thy mother a lady, both lovely and bright. I fell silent. The blue lights above flickered, letting in an instant of darkness. The willow curtain rustled and the wind moaned outside. Cold crept over me. I slowly got to my feet, picked up my own blanket and draped it over Draco. He did not move. He breathed deeply and slept on. For a very long time, I just gazed at him, memorizing the sight of him. Then I bent over my pile of things, picked up my unchanged daffodil and laid it next to his head. Words leaped to my lips that moment, but I kept them inside. I dared not make a sound. I dared not wake him. At last, I turned and pushed aside the willow curtain for the very last time, and after taking one final look behind me at Draco Malfoy, I stepped out into the thick fog.